Hello, welcome to the Essence of Tea podcast. I am super, super excited to have you here with me on this another amazing episode about tea. So today we will be talking about poor tea. Some of you might have heard of dark tea. Some of you might have heard of pu'er, pu'er tea, but technically in Chinese, there's no air sound. It's actually pretty hard to pronounce that R. I remember growing up, some of my cousins who were immigrants to the U.S. had a really hard time pronouncing rat. Now, for me, I actually was born in Hong Kong, but I grew up in Fairbanks, Alaska, and that's where I reside currently with my company, Sipping Streams Tea Company. So I visited Yunnan before in China, and I've visited Pu'er, and Pu'er, just kind of like the numbers one, two, three in Chinese, yi, er, san. So that sound is Pu'er that you would pronounce, but in Cantonese, which I'm actually from Hong Kong, so I speak Cantonese, it's Bo Lei. Totally different sound. So Bo Lei Cha is the same as Pu'er Ti or Pu'er Cha. So that's kind of confusing sometimes, especially if you're in a really big populated area like Hong Kong and you're like looking for some poor tea and everyone's saying bo cha. And they keep showing you this other thing or they call it some other name. There's different names that they will call the poor tea, but essentially they're all the same. And they're usually, if they're authentic, are from Yunnan province. So for me, growing up speaking Cantonese is kind of funny because now that I own an award-winning tea company, my Chinese tea terminology is in Mandarin. And then my everyday speaking dialect is in Cantonese. And sometimes I get the two confused, especially when I'm traveling in China or going to Hong Kong. Um, But those are just some differences, some drastic differences of the dialects in China. Now, when you go to Yunnan, it's even more drastic. There are about 16 indigenous people groups of China. So they all have their native tongues. So when I was a kid, my mom would say, you know, like the native people, like the native people of China, they're different. They look a little bit different. We're we're not native. I'm like, what do you mean? We're not Chinese? No, no, no. There's actually in like more rare minority people groups. There's already a lot, over 20 minority people groups in Yunnan, China, which is right next to Tibet. But also there are 16 indigenous Chinese people groups and they have their own dialects and their own ways and processing of poor tea. So long, long time ago, in the really far off mountains of the different mountain regions of Yunnan. Just imagine this place, beautiful mountains, high, foggy, misty mountains in the middle of nowhere, pristine rivers, people singing and dancing their own indigenous celebrations, all farming tea in these extremely remote areas. Now imagine that and knowing that each one of your villages was required to pay tribute to your emperor. So these people who didn't even speak the same dialect knew it was called on to them to pay tribute with their best tea. If that's what their village had to offer, what they were known for was tea, then that's what they would bring. If they were known for China or for silks or for fruit, that's what they would pay tribute. But in in the mountainous regions of Yunnan, in these amazing pristine areas, they were known for producing tea that has been passed on from generation to generation to generation. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Yunnan before, but it is absolutely amazing, absolutely beautiful. And no wonder the people of Yunnan don't ever want to leave 
they have it made for themselves. All natural beauty, nature provides everything. And I've heard it said when I visited Yunnan before, and I have visited many different regions of Yunnan to all these different poor factories, that the people who created the movie Avatar kind of made the movie after the indigenous people of Yunnan. And so when you look at the trees, first of all, that movie Avatar, the the amazing mega enormous trees that are brilliant, you can see that they are just so pristine and special. And you would never think you would see such a thing until you've been to Yunnan and you would look at a tree and go, I get where they got their inspiration for the movie Avatar. And when you look at their religious beliefs and their reincarnation of taking their families, and these are different people groups and indigenous people groups of Yunnan, they take the ashes of their family members and put them at the feet of these ancient trees that make tea, that are camellia sinensis plants, ancient hues, meters long or meters tall, trees, camellia sinensis evergreen trees that their ancestors become part of the tree. Are you seeing how it's kind of correlated with the movie Avatar? Isn't that just crazy? Now, how did poor become poor? Well, first of all, it was not called poor. It came in so many different dialects because the people had their own dialects. And now when I was a kid, my mom would say, you know, the native people of China, just like the native people of Alaska. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like Americans live in Alaska, Chinese people live in China. And what she was trying to say was the indigenous people of Alaska are different tribes that we have here, are different indigenous groups of Alaska, whether you're Clinket, Haida, Athabascan, Gwich'in, those are some of the indigenous people groups of Alaska. So in China, they have their own indigenous people groups. And it was called so many different things. So for hundreds of years, these indigenous people groups of Yunnan, just one region of China, would go on these very steep high mountains, traveling by horseback or having to walk next to their horse, packed with cakes, cakes of poor tea. What they practiced was packing teas, compressing them, tea cakes, tea bricks, taking them for trade, taking them for tribute to these long paths and journeys that had to keep the tea leaves pristine enough that by the time the end user got them or the emperor got them, that the tea leaves couldn't be all crushed up. So if you imagine loose poor tea leaves, which there are loose poor tea leaves, and I have several of them here, loose poor tea leaves that are dried, and you're having this horse loaded with all these cakes, all this weight of tea going to the emperor, your leaves are going to be crushed up, right? You're not going to have pristine tea anymore. It's going to be crumbles, powders. What kind of emperor would accept that? right? It would just kind of be like, do you, do you not care that I get good tea? <laughs> so traditionally, they were packed in these big stacks of compressed cake, cake after cake, and they would balance it on the horses. And they call this ancient road where poor was taken the ancient tea horse road. So many parts of this ancient tea horse road don't necessarily exist anymore, but parts of them do. I always thought it'd be really cool to hike it, but parts of it, when I asked the people in China, they said, that's kind of ridiculous. There's highways on part of it. You can't walk on a highway. <laughs> and other parts are like in the middle of nowhere, in the forest, and it's just absolutely beautiful, but it'd be very interesting to take a trek of the whole tea horse road. So traditionally, it was tea leaves that were compressed and dried that way. But while they were hiking and while they were 
um, going up these misty mountains and it might have spring rains or whatever's going on. And then you, you would dry off you yourself because you're all wet walking in the rain would dry off with a campfire. Your tea is right next to you. Your basket loads of tea are right next to you. So you can imagine the smokiness of the campfire being absorbed into the tea leaves, the outside of the tea leaves becoming quite you know, kind of musty a little bit, a little bit earthy, almost like it's providing an environment for microbes to grow. Now today, poor is known for being compressed, even though there are many versions of it. And these are some of the versions I want to show you today. So we have them in Bing Chas, these cakes. This is actually an abnormal cake. This is a 500 gram cake, and this is a championship um, award-winning uh, ripe poor cake. Now there are many versions of poor. There is the ripe or cooked one, or there are the green kind, which don't go through the extra processing to make it as musty and as strong. So there are different cakes here. And then we also have um, mini tochas, kind of like a little button compressed in these little paper things. We also have them in regular tochas. They kind of look like a bird's nest, but they're kind of like, look like a big old button. And you might see them always wrapped in paper. Sometimes you'll even see the poor um, stuffed in bamboo or mandarin orange peels. That is also very, very common. So, um, they're, but they're usually in a way where it can absorb and breathe. And that's kind of key to pour is to allow it to breathe. Oops. Oh my goodness. I just lost a bunch of pour. <laughs> so um, that little, the tocha had a bunch of crumblies on the inside from transport. So you can see them in many ways. And I guess we'll be making this white moon pour that is really shiny and white. Now, is this a white tea? No, not necessarily. Because of the processing, it becomes poor tea. Poor is the only tea that truly ferments and kind of ages like a wine. It's the only one that is really fermented and is initiated to be slightly compostable to encourage microbes to grow in it. And so since I accidentally got some of that ripe poor or cooked poor crumbles into this nice raw white moon loose pour. I'll make some of this one. So what's really interesting about pour tea is there are many ways to make it. You can have it loose, like I said, or you can have um, it in cakes where you have something that looks like a letter opener and you'll have to pry the chunks of the pour off of it. If you use a flathead screwdriver, you'll struggle, but it's not as sharp as accidentally stabbing yourself with a pour knife. So one of the very th first things you want to do is to rinse your tea. Now, in the Chinese tea ceremony, you can easily, easily rinse your yixing pots and then rinse your tea leaves. But with nice, poor tea, it always goes through a quick rinse. And in tra the traditional Chinese tea ceremony, you're rinsing everything anyways. It just keeps everything nice and sanitary. But what's signature about all poor is that slightly earthy, musty, woodsy, mossy flavor that people just love to enjoy. So a very quick rinse is always very important. It helps open up the tea leaves, um, helps clean off any you know, impurities, weird smells that it might have been next to. Because remember, this is a very, very porous paper container. Now, when you store your poor tea, you always want to store your poor tea away from high humidity or moisture. So you don't want that to ruin your tea. Now, you can use close to boiling water and steep it for about 30 seconds. Now it will really depend if your pour is going to be a compressed cake or like this or like this, or if it's something loose that's going to open up very quickly. And then you can just serve it. And it's typically a really good pour. You can steep probably 
six to eight times, especially if it's a compressed cake. It will extrude, it will change its flavor over its steepings. And it's absolutely amazing. Now, the story about how poor got its name. Like I said before, the indigenous people groups didn't speak the same dialect. And so when they didn't speak the same dialect, they would bring the tea to the emperor and they would say, what is this? And they would call it whatever they called it, whatever they called that dark tea, that style of making that type of tea. Now, that style of making that tea was called so many different names and most emperors probably didn't even notice because it was not their favorite cup of tea. Well, one year, the person who was the emperor that year was said, this is so amazing. This is the best tea under heaven. We need to declare this as the best tea under heaven. That emperor was a big fan of this tea, this dark tea. Some people call it dark tea. And, and so they said, what kind of tea is this? And it, it had so many different names. So it was declared because the city, the city, the trading city of Pur and the factories, the tea factories there, were kind of a central location where a lot of people brought in their Pur. So they would call this tea Pur, named it after the central trading area. So that is actually how it's got its name. But when you think about the indigenous people of all these different places of Yunnan province in China and, and the, the centuries of passing down these family recipes, essentially worshiping these tea plants because they are their ancestral history, you can see why this tea was very, very special to them, whether the emperor liked it or not. Now, coming forth to present day, how do we have these different styles of processing? What makes these teas so special? What's the difference of red tea, green tea? So many questions that people ask all the time. What about the vintages? What about the years? And so these cakes that we have here, they they cost about, um, I, we have them on our website now at sippingstreams.com, but they're between 200 and um, $500. Just depends on the year. Typically a good raw pour, and that's the pre no extra step way of making it, a really good raw pour will peak at about nine years. Now these cakes are from like 2005. It is now 2020. So these cakes have definitely aged well. So this is a good time to be drinking these teas. Essentially, poor tea is kind of like a wine where it gets better with age. Now, some people prefer more of that mustiness, more of that hearty, dark earthiness. And that was a flavor that was discovered from the ports of Hong Kong, from the warehouses that stored it. Now, remember when I was saying you don't want to store your poor tea, these dry tea leaves, somewhere where it's going to get wet. Now, in Hong Kong, it's extremely humid. It's extremely hot and humid along the ocean, lots of you know ships coming and going, a great port mecca, right? So these warehouses where these poor cakes would be stored before being exported to the rest of the world, these poor cakes that were being stored in these warehouses were sitting in this humid climate. And these poor factories, whether it was in um, Shishwambana or wherever they were made in these famous poor factories, would sell the poor the same poor cakes either straight from Yunnan or from Hong Kong. And what they discovered were the end users preferred the taste of the poor when it came out of Hong Kong. Now they're like, well, well what's the difference? I don't get it. It's the same tea, right? No, it's the environment that these porous cakes go through and these leaves that are exposed to the elements go through that changes it. It changes the aging process. And so when so many people are saying, I want my teas to taste more of like when they shipped out of Hong Kong, what is the difference? The difference is that humidity and that heat. And so now cooked or red or ripe poor 
they go through an extra step to imitate that stronger, mustier, accelerated aging process. So it's ready to drink, and that's what poor fans really like. So there's a lot to the different years and the vintages of poor teas. In fact, I mean, the years alone and the location of which mountains these tea leaves were picked off of, and then it's storage, and whether it's ripe or raw, all of those things make poor a very, very in-depth category of teas. It's just extremely complex. We have a cake of poor that my father didn't really even realize he owned is worth over $5,000. Now, it's just hidden from myself in my house, but one day I was looking at a poor collector's um, I guess like an encyclopedia to find out which were vintages, what were the years, what are they worth, how rare are they, how do you tell counterfeit pours. When I first got into poor teas or all kinds of teas in my tea business, when I first got into them, I went to Guangzhou, which is a great port location that a lot of poor collectors live there. It's a great trading center. And so a lot of teas are taken there. And at the time when I had gone to visit Guangzhou and then go, going to Guangxi and other areas of China to visit tea farms, I was hearing on the phone, all these people trading tea like crazy. Like, what is going on? Why is people like putting down thousands of dollars of, of money for, for poor? And I didn't know what was going on until I was hearing the aftermath of it all, that there was a bunch of quote unquote fake or counterfeit poors that were being traded, that some of this stuff wasn't even poor tea leaves. And when I had gone to some tea factories in Guangxi, I went to a factory that was about to be closed and converted into a mango farm. It's interesting, huh? Oh my gosh, this is absolutely amazing. If you love sweet, sweet teas and aren't so much into the mustiness, you've got to try this white moon poor loose leaf tea. This is amazing. And we do have these available on our website at sippingstreams.com. But, oh my goodness. If you like sweeter teas, trying to get into pours, don't really like the mustiness, I would definitely highly recommend this. But anyways, this poor factory that was changing into a mango farm was selling their quote-unquote ugly. This is what he told me. My tea leaves are ugly, quote-unquote. So we're selling them to tea factories in Yunnan province, shipping them to the West to be made into poor tea. Now tell me what seems wrong. It's kind of like buying champagne, like true champagne, not made in France. So I was like, oh my goodness. That's when I started putting together the puzzle in my head. I'm like people are literally paying thousands of dollars investing in shipping containers of poor that are not actually even from Yunnan because they knew it was valuable. So people started like stockpiling poor tea. Now in the market, there are still counterfeits out in the market. It's really hard to tell counterfeits, but the style of making that tea, that kind of tea where you um, have that earthy and mustiness, you can make that tea anywhere in the world. You can make it in Vietnam and in Indonesia. That processing is relatively similar, but there'll be different tastes. But those tea leaves for a highly valued, authentic pours will be from Yunnan province. The tea leaves will be from Yunnan province. They will be manufactured in Yunnan province and they have absolutely amazing, gorgeous teas. I had this quote unquote grandma pour that I found in this small village, which was one of my prized teas that I got the last time I went to Yunnan was all loose leaf. It was a green pork because she just made it. It was loose leaf. That's all she had. I bought the whole lot and it wasn't even that big. It's like, you know, half the size of me. I was like hugging it like a giant teddy bear getting on the bus because I was just shocked how amazing this rare, unique batch of this loose leaf green pork was. It actually had whole Camellia sinensis flowers in it too. She picked these flowers and put them in. And it was just so special. So I just called it Grandma Poor because she was this little old lady who would shimmy up on a bamboo hole and pick the tea leaves off of this ancient family tea plant. So 
I, I don't even think I have any more of it left, but it was very, very special and dear to my heart. So if you're interested in learning more about poor, we teach all about tea in our university program. And that program, you can learn more about it at bits.ly slash universa hyphen T. So that's university. It's also in the show notes, but we also just love teaching about tea and we have many different tea classes that we offer at sippingstreams.com. So we have three different online courses that you can choose from there if you're interested in learning more about tea. But as you can see, our passion is tea, education, health, and wellness. There are also many health benefits with tea and with poor. So we hope you join us sometime in one of our tea classes soon. Also, if you love, love listening to our podcast, could you please consider writing a rating and review? We would love to hear what you have to say about our show, and we would love to see any feedback that you have for us. In fact, in fact, right now, I want to read one of our ratings and reviews that we got this past week, and it was so, so sweet. So this rating and review was from... Juliet Shepard of Shepard and All. She says, this podcast makes me want to just take a few to share a cup of tea together. Jenny is a knowledgeable tea connoisseur whose enthusiasm is absolutely contagious and you want to share it. The Essence of Tea podcast is an upbeat and uplifting slice of joy anyone can tap into at any time. Well, congratulations, Juliet. Thank you so much for writing a rating and review. So every week starting today, every Tuesday, we record a live podcast and we'll be choosing one lucky winner who sent us a screen grab, a screenshot, and emailed it to us at hello at sippingstreams.com. So every Tuesday, we are going to be choosing one lucky winner who leaves us a rating and review. How do you leave a rating and review about our podcast? Well, if you subscribe to us on Stitcher or on Apple Podcasts, there's a way for you in the podcast to submit a rating and review before you submit it, before you you hit the submit button, make sure you take a screenshot of that and send us that picture to hello at sippingstreams.com. We would love to see your rating and review and read it out loud on our podcast. So Juliet, thank you so much for writing a rating and review. And we really, really appreciate it. And for our appreciation, we are going to gift you this reusable boba teacup that is all BPA free, and it comes with an expandable, reusable stainless steel straw with a pipe cleaner too. So if you are interested in writing us a rating review and you don't quite listen to us on Stitcher or Apple Podcasts, just go to either Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, and Stitcher might be easier if you're an Android user and anyone can submit a rating review on Stitcher. So you can go to stitcher.com on your phone or your mobile device or even on a desktop or laptop and send us a rating and review. We have so many different amazing, wonderful tea prizes to give out every Tuesday till Christmas. So if you use Spotify, we would love for you to subscribe. If you use Google Podcasts, you would we would appreciate it if you would subscribe. But the two places that I know of that accept rating and reviews are Apple Podcasts and Stitcher.com. So thank you everyone so much for joining us today. We sure hope you had an amazing time learning about poor tea and the ancient tea horse road. We hope that we are the joy to your cup of tea each week and we can't wait to see you again next week. Thank you everyone.